might be around for uh, week two of the Fall Peninsula 2012 season. Uh, once again, we put it out there for your questions from the viewers. Straight to our brains, goes through this weird system of pipes and think like Mario World 8 on Super Mario 3. Yeah. Uh, you know. It's all messed up in there. And then it comes spewing out of our mouths in this segment, better known as the lightning round. So Rodney Huffman gets us started. And he wants to know, who do you think are the top three catchers in the league at the moment? Um, I don't know if we're each going to, we'll just spit off some names, and I'm just going to make it easy, a name I put out there earlier. Well, I don't put it at the top yet, but once again, I love the play of Alex Nocter I saw last week. He's knocturing on the door of that top three. I love I, love <laughs> and we'll see how his play behind the plate continues. Yeah, I think Nocter uh, was very impressive, and I think if he can maintain that on a consistent basis, I'm not ready to crown him based on one game, but damn, if he didn't play at that level. If I want to crown him, I'll go ahead and crown him. If you want to crown him, they crown ass! <laughs> they are who we thought they were! And we let him off the hook! <laughs> but no Nocter played at that level, but I'm not ready to put him uh, quite up there yet. Yeah, there's so many good catchers in this league. I think this is one of the toughest when I was filling out my Peninsula ballot last year, the toughest category, I think, was in catcher. And it just got harder this year. So um, I think Roger Jackson for the 5 o'clockers, obviously he's always in the conversation. Great damn catcher. Uh, Eric Stevens, obviously. Um, we know him from JFK uh, for mm -hmm. the last uh, three years. I mean, I think that so he's always up there. Um, Michael Nashi for Battlestar, um, Curtis Fabian for the Situation. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of good catchers here. Uh, I think uh, Matthew Kalp for Foot Snipers is great. Uh, Trey McGlon, he's won at some of the highest levels uh, on a national stage. He's won the Founders Cup before with Panic Attack. He's definitely uh, in that conversation with Pitch Please. Uh, yeah, it's so so much talent. Um, I think one one person who's uh, you got to put in that conversation is actually Manny Anderson from Kickass. He seemed to make the move over from Charger to catcher this season. So he was second team All Peninsula Charger. Now he's going to catcher, and I think that actually fits his natural abilities a little bit better. So I see him as being really someone who's going to. Um, and I saw him this week. He had a great game. I think he's going to continue to improve at catcher, but. Um, Top three, I just named ten people right there, so I can't, yeah. even, I can't even narrow it down because they're all, depending on the night, they could all be the top catcher in the league. Yeah, the one name that you mentioned that I'm going to go with is Eric Stevens. That yeah. guy has been just tremendous every time I've played against him. I mean, I, I, he just he's phenomenal. So I, I literally just the, the resume that he's put out, over the times I played in Waka, I have to vote him as the guy has player. one speed. Like it's not a it's not a dial. It's a switch. Yeah, it's it's just on or boom. Off. Like <laughs> Charlie Sheen, he only has one gear. Yeah. Go. And That's now that right. he got he cut the hair, he used to have long hair into a ponytail, and then he cut it for no, uh, more aerodynamic feel, and it's just really helped him out. It's been yeah. no looking back since then. <laughs> no. All right, so moving right along, we have a question from the aforementioned Mister. Emmanuel Anderson, a.k.a. Manny. Um, he wants to know what's up with him, 40 acres and a mule, and he assures us this is a serious question. Well, Manny, I'm really glad you asked that because my seventh graders next week will be learning about this. So uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1866 did insure all new, and the Freedmen's Bureau of carpetbaggers who came south and ensured newly freed slaves that they would receive 40 acres of farmland plus a mule, plus farming supplies, um, and about 40,000 acres on the eastern coast of South Carolina and Georgia were set aside. However, due to Lincoln's assassination, Andrew Johnson, the former senator from Tennessee, who, for his loyalty to the Union, he was the only southern senator to remain in Congress after secession. He was appointed Lincoln's vice president in the 1864 election. He then rose to the presidency and while Congress was out of session, issued massive pardons to hire.
their land uh, through what was somewhat a legal process on the local level. And then those uh, men who had been guaranteed and had been granted those 40 acres, they held them for less than a year. Uh, and then they became sharecroppers on that land and remain so. And then, while sharecropping, most of your crop goes towards rent money that the plantation owners would charge them. Some would call it just another form of slavery under a different name. Uh, of 1876, where Rutherford B. Hayes, a, uh, <laughs> Hey. How do you know hey, all this, man? He's a professor. <laughs> uh, who was, uh, you know, has sentiments for the South. Uh, then ended the Reconstruction period. Virginia was actually classified Military District 1. We were under the rule of General John Schofield during the Reconstruction <laughs> era. Reconstruction ended, uh, and then the southern states, their uh, leaders were allowed to return based on Johnson's part and Hayes' ending of the Reconstruction. The Black Codes, and later dubbed the Jim Crow Laws, were instituted. Uh, yes, uh, more well known. <laughs> yes, poll taxes and so on and so forth to uh, disenfranchise the newly freed black voters. Yeah, so uh, what's up with Manning's 40 Acres? I, no, I got it for you. So, uh, Manny Anderson, Captain of Kick-Ass, oh, so wanted to know, says, are the foot snipers still worth a top five ranking after getting situated in week one? And does he believe, he wants to know, are captains paying their votes for the captain's power pull based on performance or potential? Which, you know, in this early going, uh, I guess you have to lean towards potential. At, Brent pointed out earlier, small sample sizes, you know, depends on the opponent and everything. Please, someone else talk. These hiccups are killing me. I think it's a combination of both uh, as far as potential and performance. So for me personally, uh, because I do have a ballot in the captain's uh, top ten poll, I had the uh, foot snipers at seventh, I believe. Uh, so I penalized them pretty heavy. I had them number two to start out the season in my poll. Uh, but I penalized them for a pretty lopsided loss to the situation. Uh, however, I don't think necessarily that they are, um, I mean, they're a talented team. And in the end, they'll be in the conversation. They'll get back to the top five. But that's just how I do my poll. Other coaches were more lenient with them, and uh, they kept them in their top five. And I think that's where Manny's question is coming from. But uh, to answer his question, I think it depends on the person. But overall, uh, hell yeah, foot snipers are a damn good team. Uh, yeah, they got their asses kicked week one, but that's one game. Let's see what they do the rest of the, uh, yeah, especially through this next month when they have a really tough schedule. I would say phrases asses kicked and, and all that stuff. I mean, that game was closer than the score decided. So me personally, I would still keep foot snipers as a top five team 100%. Yeah. So to fuck that up, Keith Moorhart wanted to talk league <laughs> generalities. Um, and I'm sorry, I can't sing this half-naked boy as Keith Moorhart's profile picture. Really kind of throws me off. The chubby gangster. Yeah. Uh, he says, there are a lot of new teams, teams that have been rebuilding this year. And he wants to know from the three of us general advice on how to keep building and improving through the first half of the season to ready yourself for the tournament. He, I guess I'll take this one uh, since I have the most experience with actually uh, playing in more than a <laughs> tournament games. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, how to how to keep building and improving for the tournament? I think you just gotta, uh, <laughs> you know, you just gotta be positive about it and just uh, keep encouraging your teammates. Really, these are emotions, Brent, not facts and good hard recommendations. Well, you know, uh, encourage your teammates. Be positive. Why aren't you kicking your ball screen? <laughs> this isn't Jamie cheerleading. 
<laughs> but you got you got to do that because it's a rec sport, so no one's out there to be chewed out like they're playing. You know, Friday. You don't play ref. Like they're not Friday. You know, Friday night lights or whatever. So, I you know, keep building and improving. You just got to learn from your mistakes. Uh, as a captain, I think what's important is you look at your team's strengths and you build your lineup in a way that's going to maximize your potential to score runs. Uh, defensively, you just got to keep teaching. You know, that's all it is, is uh, situational awareness. Uh, you just keep teaching, coaching. That's all it is. I mean, I don't know. I, maybe I can instill my knowledge through this. Uh, I can. Segment. Well, if you want to right. take time out after this, Brent will explain leadership yeah, to you. We'll just do a whole oh, separate segment. Today. The law of the lid. Law I'll, number one. I'll tell you the biggest mistake that John teams Maxwell. make, and this has been for me coming from a person that never played kickball before up until now, is that you start until today? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I still don't know how to play the game, but is when you start overdoing it. When uh, a ball gets overthrown, and then you take the ball, you try to yeah, throw yeah, it to yeah. another person. That is probably one of the main things that will ruin like an inning and get a lot of runs in. Like, just be smart about it. Like, if you can't make the play, just get it back to the pitcher. Like, that's what you need to work on. Is just the fundamentals of just smart play. Because if you keep trying to throw out like and take chances, it's really going to kick you in the butt. I think that's a great point, uh, and it kind of reminded me of, of another point. Like for teams, uh, I think a lot of times if you're going into a matchup where you're not the favored squad, uh, some teams go into those. You got to have confidence. You got to believe in your team and your 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 group that you can compete and that you can beat those guys. Because a lot of times I see it where, you know. It used to happen all the time, especially back in the Emperor's Club days, where we'd go into a game and we won that game before it even started. Not because the team we were playing wasn't talented, but because they were already psyched out in their heads. So just be confident, be positive, keep playing hard, learn from your mistakes, and that's what's up. There it is. So our next comment comes from Mr. Jesse Rogers, who says, "Don't don't sleep on the foul balls." Y'all can laugh all you want to right now. I believe I will. <laughs> Say it again. Say it again. <laughs> Don't sleep on the foul walls. What's the next question? Uh, uh, keep going, man. Uh, keep going. Uh, he, he says, just oh, wait. A uh, dot, dot, dot. Yeah, uh, we wait. We um, wait. I'll be waiting uh, and chuckling. Uh, oh, man. He looks like a scary guy, though. So I'm yeah, like, he's oh, very intense. <laughs> he's in the military. But he's on the foul ball, so, you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Peyton knows what I'm talking about. Yeah. Uh, uh, I wouldn't know, because I never signed up. We're laughing because we don't think there are threats to be. Rodney Huffman, uh, no, fuck you, you already had one. <laughs> fuck you. Andy Doy, show. Oh. if you ask about the podcast again, I will. Oh, yeah. It will come out when it comes yeah, out, man. Yeah, Don't worry yeah. about that. This, this clearly Just make them jello time. shots, baby. Uh, Wes McLean, can we put a dome over War Memorial Stadium with the Walker Petty Cash Fund? No. Yes. This ain't the Detroit Lions, man. Vote. We play in the conditions. No more uh, mid-season or end-of-season parties for the next 300 years. We no! Just, we just got irrigation. What more do you want? Um, Amy, don't care. Um, Amy, still, stop. Amy and Rodney, don't have a personal conversation. Yeah, take that to the message. <laughs> uh, Keith Moorhart would like to talk about the karaoke powerhouse. Woo! He mentions the Wellbrock Moriarty Moorharts, um, throws in a Jillian Sims and a Dennis Dolson, and then Mr. Brian No Shoes Moore kick it things off. And yes, he did start the evening with I believe in a thing called love, yeah. which I did enjoy. But I enjoyed. 
as one of the karaoke experts, let me just say, that Jillian Sims is by far the most talented singer in Waka Peninsula. Mm. Every time she goes up there, you can say what you want, man. I know where your heart's at, but <laughs> Jillian Sims running that. We gotta get Dennis to Golston. The national anthem. That's oh, absolutely. Dennis Golston, no, singing the national anthem, anthem, anthem is number anthem. two. No Shoes does a fantastic job with those songs that I wouldn't even touch because I, my voice would crack. But the charisma is with the Moriarty, Wellbrock, Morehart Brothers duo going against each other. You're talking about 90s grunge and early 90s pop? Mm -mm -mm. It's amazing what those uh, $3 pounders will do to you. Make I will you, sing some shit. Make you feel like you got some charisma. Huh? Mm -hmm. Oh, I got lots of charisma. That's all I got is charisma. Not talent. That's, <laughs> that, that's what you've been riding the last Jill that's, why I still have a, that's why I still have a seat at this table. My my uh, my vote's on Jill sure. Sims. When she does a No Doubt song, I really Hell think yeah. it, I close my eyes and I think about a Gwen Stefani concert. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. I always ask Shaw if he wakes up to her as an alarm clock. Like she just comes up like, don't speak. That's you why they just want she's, your she's, she's a, a sparrow. Yeah. To his condor. Yeah. Uh -uh. Hey, how, how, how do you do a sparrow chant? Sparrow. I like that. Uh, the mighty sparrow. Like, wait, did I already do this? Yes. Yeah. That's where we, that's where we got. Oh, really? Well, when you're rocking with the sparrow, you can barely follow the clock. All, all, minutes now, all, minutes. all zero Ted Leo fans who view this podcast, there you go. You just got a sweet in reference. So here's, um, I think those are all the questions we have this week. Thank you guys for uh, watching this crap. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, please share your feedback on the uh, Facebook page. Um, follow the public Facebook page at uh, facebook.com slash Waka Peninsula. Uh, like or follow us on Twitter, twitter.com slash Waka VA Peninsula. Um, yep. It's, we're getting out of control. It's 1130 on Friday night. We're about to go choke some alligators and all that. So thank you for watching. <laughs> that three is up. what we're calling it now. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for watching three up, three down. See you Wednesday at the fields. Motherfucker.